Hey, what's up everybody? Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever time of day you are deciding to watch these videos. Um, so we're getting into the last bit of the semester here. So I want to kind of, I don't know, maybe express a few words of um, encouragement. You know, we're, we're really getting into the, the last few weeks. We're getting into the last bit of the materials. And I know that it might be a bit of a slog in that like, you're like, oh my gosh, there's so much work piling up. Likely not just for my class, but likely for classes kind of across the board. So I want to kind of encourage you a little bit to don't give up, don't slow down. We're almost there. We are nearly to the end. Um, and that's kind of one of the reasons why I leave sort of the more funnish material perhaps uh, to the very end of the semester. Um, to kind of maybe keep us motivated and keep us wanting to learn um, the rest of the oceans in terms of biology from what this class can offer. Um, so I just wanted to to kind of maybe stem a little bit of, um, of encouragement and uh, feelings of that nature to you so that we can all finish strong. I'm also saying those things for myself as well because <laughs> it's definitely... Um, Definitely getting there in terms of <laughs> near the end. Uh, some big announcements uh, include, of course, we're obviously nearing the end of the semester, so please do not um, leave off the smart book reading assignments to the very end. You're not going to be very happy with me or yourself. Um, and yeah, uh, we, we know at this point how long those take to do, so don't put those off. They're a great study tool for your final. Um, if you are behind on any work, please work on getting those things in, namely your project. Um, that's worth a big chunk of your grade, or a pretty decent chunk of your grade anyway. Um, and really, really pay attention to my formatting if you haven't um, turned that in already. Um, and then, yeah, just kind of keeping up on all the other assignments um, and things of that nature. So reach out if you need any help, guidance, or assistance. I am here to help guide and assist you. That is quite literally my job. Um, so just keep all those things in mind and we can make it to the end of the semester together. <laughs> um, that also said, if you are watching this in the spring of 2024, you can negate the next video's first four minutes because those are pretty much the same announcements there. <laughs> um, so what we're going to cover today include finishing up um, plankton, different types of plankton, and then the next videos will go into something called productivity, which is pretty neat. So um, let's get into it. So on uh, when we last met, we um, started into this idea of plankton um, and how important they are and started with some of the few smaller types, right? So we've looked at diatoms and dinoflagellates um, and those are more silica-based or silicon-based um, plankton. And now we're gonna get into one of my favorites which are called coccolithophorids. Um, and they're my favorite one because they're just so much fun to say. Um, <laughs> and two, because they, if you look at a microscopic picture, they look like little pineapple rings. And one of my favorite all time cakes is pineapple upside down cake. And so it just reminds me of that. Um, so what's also really neat about coccolithophorids is their outer body is made up of calcium carbonate, um, ca calcium carbonate plates, which are, we also call coccoliths. Um, these tend to form in really large blooms at higher latitudes, so like closer to the polar regions, but they are found um, throughout the world's oceans. They also tend to dominate in regions of moderate to low nutrient uh, concentrations, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, what you also know about coccolithophorids is, or what you will soon know, is that their ancestors are when they're hardened and extracted, we use that as chalk. Uh, so if you've ever used a blackboard um, and used chalk, then you have used ancient coccolithophorids. So kind of a neat little concept, I think. I use chalkboards all the time at my classrooms or in my classrooms at SF State because the geologists won't let me get rid of them. <laughs> so I have the pleasure of using them at least two to four times a week. This is what a bloom can look like. This is off of the coast of Alaska. This is actually a pretty 
uh, astonishing bloom. It's huge. Um, and you can see off the coasts of Alaska here, some of this could just be straight up sediment, but potentially further out here in the water could be samples of coccolithophorids. So very, very, very visible from space, which is pretty cool. Our next type of uh, plankton that I want to talk about are cyanobacteria. Um, so these are actually the most abundant phytoplankton in low nutrient open ocean environments, so not near the coast. This is a really, really big um, difference when we're going to talk about nutrients and productivity in the oceans in the next um, few videos. So I really need to hammer on that this is in the open oceans for cyanobacteria. Um, so in the middle of the ocean, not near land. Um, these represent also the most ancient lineage of oxygen producing photosynthetic organisms. So these little nuggets are probably one of the main reasons or main contributors as to why we have oxygen in our atmosphere. And if you recall, this is this was like the beginning of um, species being able to come on to land, which is really quite cool, right? Because we had the great oxygen poisoning, which allowed for ozone to form in the stratosphere, which then helped absorb harmful UV radiation, which then animals in the ocean were like, oh my gosh, I can go out of water and not like sizzle to death, tight. And so there was this great migration onto land, at least as our, our current theories are. Anyway, we believe also that one species of cyanobacteria are responsible for anywhere from 10 to 50% of the net prim primary production in the open ocean, and they play a huge role in the carbon cycle. Um, and also play an important role in nitrogen fixation, so harnessing in and taking in nitrogen. So talking about primary productivity, I want you to think about what this word production means to you. I'm going to ask you to do that several times. Um, but basically in the oceans, it's like how much life can be sustained um, or just the process of life in a sense. Um, and so cyanobacteria play a huge role in this in photosynthesis. Remember, phytoplankton means photosynthesizing or auto, auto, autotrophic types of plankton. Um, so these little nuggets are the lungs of our atmosphere, basically. So very, very, very important point there. Um, and then last little topic that I want to get into for this particular video um, is something that I mentioned when we talked about dinoflagellates and how... Um, they're a very well-known kind of type of plankton because a lot of them can cause bioluminescence and sometimes can cause harmful algal blooms. So now I want to go into the specificity of harmful algal blooms, or HABs for short. So there's, at, the, at our current understanding, a small subset of phytoplankton that can actually produce toxins and discolor the water of um, or otherwise negatively impact human uh, and wildlife health. And I really want to just focus in on this word toxins for a second because it's really thrown around in social media right now of like, oh, this thing is so toxic for your body. Be sure to do a detox and a juice cleanse. Those are, I don't want to say fake toxins, but those are not the toxins that I'm talking about here. And those are not toxins that you should be concerned about. And don't do juice cleanses, my friends. Don't waste your money on that. Your liver and your kidneys detox your body for you. You can do things to help support liver and kidney health, um, but doing a juice cleanse literally just uh, does not do your body any good. So please don't don't uh, fall into the traps of influencers that you see on social media. If you need help with nutrition, please go to a nutritionist, a registered nutritionist. Thank you. Um, anyways. So when I talk about toxins here, I mean like a literal release of toxic materials or toxic chemicals into water, which can actually do harm to any of the creatures that um, come into contact with it or ingest those toxins. So, some example of those toxins or some example of um, negative impacts are animal death um, caused by physical contact or irritation of the gills. Um, it basically like almost like a, a toxic uh, water environment where it can almost choke out um, or kill animals just from contact. Um, almost like drowning in a sense if you if, if first uh, a way to maybe think about that. Um, development of low nutrient conditions during blood decay. So another word for this is actually called dead zones. So sometimes um, with too much nutrients in the water, something called a, harm, uh, um, a dead zone can occur because too much algae takes up the space in the top of the water and that doesn't allow for light to come through 
um, the water column. So you're basically like putting a big blanket or cloudiness on the surface of the water, which um, kills animals. And then the decomposers, the bacteria in there, use up the rest of the oxygen, and then it creates uh, an environment completely devoid of oxygen, which is, as you could probably imagine, not great, because <laughs> most every living thing needs, needs at least a little bit of oxygen. There can also be a formation of ecologically disruptive algal blooms, or EDABs, um, and then for humans, in human consumption, the most common route is through shellfish. So if you're allergic to shellfish, have no fear, you're, gonna, you're doing great uh, <laughs> in terms of potentially getting poisoned through harmful algal blooms. So uh, the next few things here are, are really fascinating. So I'll hone into uh, what this uh, map is showing um, on the next slide or kind of defining what all the colors mean and some of the, um, the uh, potential or the risks with all of these different colors. But I want to focus on the um, on the picture here on the right hand side. So this is from New Zealand, and this is an example of a um, plankton bloom. And maybe you've heard of harmful algal blooms called red tides. Um, and scientists are actually trying to pivot away from calling them red tides because you can still have a harmful algal bloom without it discoloring the water red. Um, but some of the first, perhaps some of the first instances of harmful algal blooms were this kind of reddish color, which is where it got its initial name of red tide. Um, and then this map over here is showing where, um, where harmful algal blooms can occur throughout the world, or throughout the world, throughout, the, um, throughout America. And what I want to point out are a couple of things. Um, that I hate this map for a couple of reasons because they're that's missing some things. And if you pay attention to it, uh, if you pause the video for a second and maybe have a look around, maybe some things look a little bit weird. Uh, <laughs> um, that's because it's negated some borders. So apparently Iowa and Missouri are combining to be two state or one state and uh, Wisconsin and Illinois. <laughs> and hey, we, uh, California took in some part of Oregon. <laughs> just, oh gosh. Uh, and you know, what happened to some of these borders? Anyway, so it just cracks me up um, in terms of, of this particular map. Um, but what I also want to point out is that these harmful algal blooms do not occur just in ocean water. Um, they can occur in freshwater bodies as well, um, so like larger lakes, larger ponds. Um, and I would argue this is probably not the only locations that harmful algal blooms can occur. These are probably just the ones that your book hones in on. Excuse me. And then the graphic over here, or excuse me, the table over here on the right-hand side kind of breaks down um, the, uh, the legend here on the bottom right of the map, kind of going through each of the toxins um, the conditions that they produce and the plankton that can be responsible for that and the characteristics or maybe the consequences of these blooms. Um, focusing over kind of here in California, we have the green, so the cyanohabs, which are actually not on the list here, but we also have our PSP, which is, doo -doo 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 -doo, where are you? This little guy right here. Um, so this can cause paralysis and respiratory failure in humans. Um, and then we also have ASP, which is this little nuggy here, um, which acts on the vertebrae nervous system. So uh, some, s several different uh, ways that we can be impacted by harmful algal blooms. But then if you look down here in the south in the Gulf of Mexico, you pretty much have every single freaking color here, um, which is not great. But so the biggest one, that purple, is NSP, so neurotoxic shellfish poisoning. Um, so it can affect our nervous system, uh, respiratory failure in fish and marine mammals, and food poisoning symptoms in humans. So the reason that this matters and the reason that we care is because, guess what? Humans ingest shellfish. <laughs> it's what we do, and it's also a huge industry, right? So there's going to be a, 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 an always need or constant need for testing waters, testing your product, testing your fish to make sure that these that they don't have these toxins in them that can cause harm to humans. Um, this is also why it's really important to always be tracking where, um, where folks are getting their uh, fish from and their products from. So there are systems in place, and I think this will vary from state to state, 
Um, but this is, you know, kind of a good thing to recognize where regulations are a good thing, right? Because if you have uh, like a, a like a similar thing would be like an E. coli outbreak or something like that, where it's just like, oh my gosh, there's where did this come from? And tracking it down and making sure things get recalled. Similar sort of idea here. Um, Especially because, like, getting food poisoning, I think, from from seafood is more common. Is actually pretty freaking common because it's such a an easy thing to either contaminate or to go bad quickly. Um, and if you are someone who is in the restaurant industry or have worked in a kitchen, then you you know that because of the the um, the what's it called the the server handling stuff that you've had to had to do. Anyways, so I encourage you to maybe do a closer look on that table, do a closer look of that map. Um, it's really interesting stuff, I think, and I hope that um, you learned a few things from this video. So thank you so, so much for your time and attention, and I'll see you in the next one.